Welcome back, traders and investors here. We're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about market structure with Kevin McPartland of Greenwich Associates. Kevin, how are you doing this morning? Great. How are you? Thanks for having me. Oh, no, glad to have you on here. Uh, but just briefly, give us a little bit of uh, your education and uh, background in the markets. Sure. Yeah, I have a computer science degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, upstate New York. I've um, been in the market since, I guess my first internship was in 1998 with J.P. Morgan. Um, spent a bunch of years there, uh, a good amount of time as a management consultant, making my way around uh, the investment banks. Um, spent some time uh, recently at BlackRock and then uh, joined Greenwich Associates, uh, I guess, just coming on seven months ago. Oh, okay. uh, focused, uh, been, been focused on market structure for really the last six or seven years now. So who are your clients and uh, what kind of services do you provide them with? Yeah, so, I mean, we really work with everybody on the street. Um, uh, Greenwich is a, a research-based consulting firm, so we spend a lot of time interviewing institutional investors. We did uh, about 60,000 interviews last year. And then, uh, so my focus here, I'm the head of market structure and technology research, so we use uh, a lot of the data we collect from those interviews, also with interviews of, of the exchanges and the banks, the technology companies, to try to understand, you know, what's happening, what's changing, you know, what technology and regulations and, and behavior changes will do to the market. Okay, so are you concerned with the amount of volume that's now going um, off off exchange? It looks like 40% of our volume now is traded off exchange. Uh, looking for this trend to continue, and if so, how are the exchanges going to survive? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, in an ideal world, a perfect marketplace, right, you'd have all your buyers and sellers in one place, right? And so in theory, that would get you the most efficient pricing. But, you know, we know this isn't an ideal world, right? So you're going to have institutions that are going to go uh, where they need to go to find the liquidity. Um, you know, trade sizes have shrunk tremendously over the last 10 years, and that's really what sort of birthed uh, the, the dark pool market. So I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's, I, I think it's less about people trying to hide what they're doing and more about institutional investors trying to, you know, get their trade sizes done. Right. And that's, you know, that's not bad for retail investors, right? Most of our, you know, as retail investors, most of our money is with big institutional funds and, and we want them to, you know, execute as efficiently as possible. Um, but so, so, you, so you said about exchanges, right? So, you know, what are the exchanges going to do? I think, you know, there's a few ways to look at that. Um, the BATS direct edge merger is an interesting example, right? That's a great combination of two, um, you know, two cutting edge firms that have done very well. And, you know, you could take some, in some ways came out of nowhere over the last decade and became two of the biggest equity exchanges in the U S. Um, so they'll, you know, they'll come together. I'm sure they will be more nimble and, and, uh, you know, you know, there's, there's no debate that the profit margins and equities are shrinking for the exchanges, but you know, their, the efficiencies they'll get from coming together is, is, uh, will be great. I'm sure. And then the flip side to that story, I think a good example is the, you know, the ice nice uh, acquisition, right? And that, that's not an equities play. That's a derivatives play, right? So um, from, from what I've read, the equities revenue of that combined firm will only account for uh, about 6% of what the whole company makes, right? Hmm. So a lot of that is going to be a derivatives play. So, you know, the equities business needs to be there, capital formation and all those great things that we have equity markets for. But I think exchanges are going to, you know, I think the two models are either to be super efficient with technology or to look to derivatives to make some more money. Okay. Um, so at what point does the uh, increase in off exchange volume start to impact, uh, you know, price discovery? Could this be a deterrent to the, you know, display quotes as limit orders, you know, become discouraged because of a uh, lack of execution? Yeah, I mean, it certainly makes things more complicated. Um, I mean, that's why we've ended up with so much algo trading over the last decade. Our data shows that institutional investors do about 30% of their order flow in the U.S. through algorithms and that, you know, because you need to look everywhere to find the best price and that includes both on exchange and off exchange venues. Um, you know, al although sort of the flip side is that algo percentage hasn't really changed over the last couple of years. So that makes me think that institutional investors are sort of getting a feel for how things work and they know where to look, um, you know, they know where to look to get the best price. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're right. The last thing we want to do is, is discourage people from, uh, displaying quotes, right? The, even most of the dark pools won't even really work if there's not displayed quotes to sort of price the, uh, price the, you know, the stock, the stock off of. Okay. So you don't really, you think people are still going to continue to, you know, just try and go to the best exchange and 
get the best price and just do it in limited quantities is not to move the market then. Yeah, I mean, isn't that what it's about, right? Everybody, I mean, even if you or I log into our, our, our retail account and we want to do a single stock trade of 100 shares, right? All we're trying to do is get the best price as much as the, you know, same as the big institutional money managers just trying to get the best price. Um, you know, and best price, it may be a better way to talk about it as best execution, right? Is what's the, you know, what's the overall, if you take into account the cost of the trade and commissions and, and market impact and everything else, um, you know, it's different for different different people and different types of investors. But really, that's all we're all trying to do. So let's talk about high frequency trading. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know really emerged over the last several years. Uh, you know, some people say it's good for the markets, provides extra liquidity. Uh, some of the predatory practices of high frequency trading uh, can be a negative uh, for the market. Uh, can you give us you know both you know the good and the bad uh, on high frequency trading? Yeah, I mean it's interesting to me. We right how so how we the, the the mainstream media has been talking about this for what? But it's got to be a good six years now. It's interesting that it's still such a hot topic. Um, yeah, I mean you're right. I mean there's there's I guess there's always two sides uh, to this story. I think I mean in, in my personal view is you know broadly speaking, um, you know this provides liquidity to the market, right? And 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 I think maybe I should step back and it's worth noting that. You know, high frequency trading isn't a strategy in and of itself, right? That you know, that talks about the speed at which you're executing, maybe the speed at which your your algorithms sort of figure out what to trade. But you know, high frequency trading is not a strategy. So I I, think, I always like to sort of point that out there. But you know, these are there's a lot of firms out there that are you know are providing liquidity to the market where maybe there wouldn't be some. And we talk about you know uh, you know a lot of um, volume going off exchange. Well, the, you know, these are firms that are doing a lot of trading on exchange, and that. You know, and I, I think that's you know broadly a good thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting to me how religious this issue has become. If you, um, you know, if you look, if you if sort of watch the discussions on Twitter between you know, and these are you know major market participants going back and forth. It's really really interesting how ex extreme the views are um, on either side. Um, so I mean, I guess you know to address the negative, there's there's always you know going to be people who are looking to take advantage, and I think that's you know, regardless of whether they're trading, you know, trading high speed or, or not, right? So there's going to be that out there. And this is, you know, the sort of a one, one bad apple spoils the bunch situation where I think the majority of these firms are, you know, just out there, you know, looking to sort of make profits for their, you know, for their investors, even if those investors are all internal, um, but looking to make profits, you know, just like the rest of us are. So, I mean, to me, it's a, it's a broad, it's a broad net positive, but I know, obviously, as you said, there are others that strongly disagree. Okay, the SEC is uh, discussing a test pilot uh, to move the nickels and small caps. Uh, do you see this actually improving liquidity? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a coin cost, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, you know, it could, it could, or and it should, in theory, make uh, and more profitable for market makers, um, which could result in better liquidity, right? I mean, that's when we went to pennies way back, it was, you know, that was a big, big, big change for market makers. Even the major broker dealers, um, they had to, you know, very drastically change their operations and let people go, right? Because they just couldn't make the money they were making before. So, you know, if you widen back out to nickels, you know, it allows some of these guys to make a little bit more money. They're going to be more incentivized to come into that market, which, you know, which, uh, you know, which should be, you know, better in the, in the long run. And we talk about, you know, I know we sort of want to go back to the retail investor. Does it make it better for the retail investor? Maybe, like I said, if it brings some more liquidity to those names, but, uh, you know, I think broadly speaking, it's going to, it's going to not, it's going to not be such a major impact that people will really stand up and notice. Okay. Do you think that the overall move to pennies, uh, back in the early two thousands, do you think that really benefited the retail investor? Um, maybe a little bit. I mean, especially in the more liquid names, right? If you were if you were doing a nickel or or or, or, uh, or you know ten cents wide in in I don't know, take your pick of your favorite stocks and your your apples and GMs and your you know sort of large cap really liquid names, then you know that's probably too big of a spread, right? Those you look at those now and they're you know sub penny uh, increments, the bid ask spread. Um, so I think for for you know, those of us looking at those names, which to be honest is probably a big portion of the retail market, right? We're looking at more liquid stocks and that, that probably was a benefit. Um, you know, uh, and it, it just, it, it also in some ways, and this is a little bit simplistic, but it makes it all a little bit more readable and understandable, right? We, we talk in, uh, we talk in dollars and cents in our daily lives, uh, not in eighths and sixteenths. So, you know, 
I think it was a broad positive, but you know now I think what where we are is this is the SEC trying to refine um, that approach uh, a little more specifically rather than just taking broad brushstrokes. And uh, and you know the pennies, I guess it's just something that uh, you know from being a you know, prop trader and being able to you know read the tape, it was very you know just a whole different world when it went to pennies and then the sub pennies or something that is just you know just having a slap group of people being able to trade in sub pennies i mean come on is that does that seem really kosher to you yeah i mean this is where this is where simplicity would would be a, be, a good thing for the market as a whole right i I, you know, I sort of, I've been watching closely sort of the, the Dodd-Frank implementation over the last six years, and that's a great case study and things ending up more complicated than they need to be to try to appease, um, you know, so many different market participants. And, you know, we, we, I think we're, you know, pretty close to that situation in the equities okay. market as well, right? We should, we should, you know, step back and try to be more simple where we can. Okay, what can be done about the you know the excessive quote traffic and the quote stuffing uh, that's going on? I mean that that's you know that's actually worse than the pennies when people are just stuffing quotes in there. Um, is this a concern to you about the markets? Yeah, I mean the question is the question is should it be a concern? Do we need to do we need to scale it back? I mean this is again another place where there's strong research on both sides of the story, um, you know, but but. Well, my head, you know, when when I, you know, when we, I was thinking about this question, my head went immediately to, you know, do we want to disincentivize people for quoting on the open market? And it seems like we wouldn't, right? And it, again, goes right back to, you know, our beginning of our conversation about stuff moving off exchange. And if we, again, if we disincentivize quoting, will that move more and more off exchange? It very well could. So, it's a it's a it's, it's a, a tough issue, issue. Um, right. and, and again i wonder you know how much if, if again how much does this really impact the retail investor um and i suspect that the big you know the big uh, money managers are sophisticated enough to sort of know how to weed out and look at only what they need to look at and a lot of the major broker dealers are you know good at helping their clients to do the same thing as well so yeah I, it's hard to say how, how much of an impact it's really having and uh, on the flip side you know like i said i don't want to i don't i don't want to do anything that disincentivizes people from quoting in the open market okay is um is a market you know the way we are up at these levels are we uh, susceptible to another flash crash yeah i mean of, of course right the market's just so complicated um you know it goes back to the simplicity argument um you know what, what's what continues to happen, and what's happened for probably for decades, really, is you know something really horrible goes wrong in the market. There's some kind of crash. It doesn't matter what market it's in, and we look to solve those problems with new rules and new regulations. And the new rules and regulations are put in place to prevent the exact same thing from happening again, which is great. We don't want to have the exact same bad thing happen again, but the reality is the next problem is not going to look like the previous, right? Yeah. So we end up just with more and more and more and more rules. Um, that are trying to solve something that hasn't happened yet and that we don't know what it's going to look like. So, yeah, as much as I want to be positive and think we've made some progress, I think the complexity has only, uh, it's only gotten, gotten worse, uh, in which case, yeah, I mean, we're certainly susceptible despite uh, best efforts of market participants to try to watch out for these things. So you don't think that the current circuit breakers that are in place are enough to prevent another flash crash? I mean, it's enough to prevent the flash crash that happened before. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, right? But is it enough to prevent what happens next? And what if the flash crashes in, uh, you know, in another in another uh, product? What if it's uh, options or futures or or FX for that matter, right? It's, uh, it's I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be I don't want to be negative, but it just seems realistic looking back, even over the last ten years. You know, we'll fix one problem and another problem will pop up. It's just the nature of our sort of complex global interconnected markets. Okay, so to wrap things up, uh, you know, what are you know the two or three areas where market structure needs improvement? Yeah, I mean, I can't say too much um, that simplicity is really what we need. Although I'm realistic enough to to know that um, it doesn't seem like we're going to ever get back to a more simplistic sake. I just don't think there's political will in Washington to let us get there. Unfortunately. Um, you know, but it's like the it's like the tax code, right? It just it it shouldn't be that complicated, but it's gotten there over time. And, and thinking about trying to scale back and start again, it just it just doesn't happen. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer in natural market forces. I know that's a little simplistic and naive, and and you know we certainly do need some rules and regulations. Like I said, we don't want the one bad apple to spoil the bunch. 
uh, you know, but natural sort of supply and demand and market forces will uh, will get us a long way. Okay, simplicity works sometimes. Okay, we've had Kevin McPartland on uh, from Greenwich Associates uh, talking about uh, market structure, giving us uh, insights and perhaps uh, how to, uh, you know, how to prevent another flash crash. We certainly don't want to see that happen. Uh, Violin Maker said you were a great guest, Kevin, so that means that we'd like to have you back on again uh, if uh, your schedule permits. That sounds great. Would love to. Uh, would love to come on and talk anytime. Yeah, we'll get Dennis on, and he'll he'll be riddling, riddling you with some questions. So you got off easy this time. <laughs> I look forward to it. I can talk market structure all day. With, uh, I don't know what that says about me, but I love it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Have a good day. Thanks. You too. Take care. Bye.